Good morning. Welcome to our Good Friday service. We have come a long way with Jesus and the disciples the last 40 days of Lent, and now we're here. On the day in Jerusalem, Jesus has been arrested, as we alluded to and discussed last night during our Tenebrae service, and now we are with Jesus at the events of Good Friday. This may be the first time in your life, certainly in my life, that I've had to do Good Friday uh, online in this fashion, and we should be thankful that we can explore what it means to be with each other and to be with the disciples and to be with our Lord on the day of His crucifixion in this fantastic online space. Before we do anything else, let's light our candles. Let's light the Christ candle, which we always do, not only today as a sign that Jesus is the light of the world, but today, given the events of the previous night, to know that his light was shining alone. All his disciples had abandoned him. Judas had, be had betrayed him. He had been arrested and beaten and accused. And at the end of the service, we will snuff out the Christ candle. Before we go any further, let's do some reading. Psalm 22 will be our first reading for today to set the stage for what we encounter in the words of Jesus himself in the story of Matthew. Psalm 22, we'll read about the first half. See if the words are familiar to you. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from the words of my groaning? O oh my God, I cry out by day, but you do not answer by night, and I am not silent. Yet you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the praise of Israel. In you our fathers put their trust, they trusted you and you delivered them. They cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. They say he trusts in the Lord. So let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in the Lord. Yet you brought me out of the womb. You made me trust in you, even at my mother's breast. From birth I was cast upon you. From my mother's womb you have been my God. Do not be far from me, for trouble is near and there is no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Bashan encircle me. Roaring lions tearing their prey open, their mouths are wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart has turned to wax, it has melted away within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth, and you lay me in the dust of the earth. Dogs have surrounded me. A band of evil men has encircled me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them and they cast lots for my clothing. What we'll do is we'll read the second half of Psalm 22 on Sunday morning. But incredible that so many of the events of the crucifixion of our Lord are mentioned in Psalm 22. Even the words at the beginning that Jesus cries on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? With this psalm in our mouths and in our hearts, let us worship the Lord with our first piece of music. Again, a simple Tzai chant. Wait for the Lord whose day is near. Wait for the Lord. Keep watch and pray.
when we left the story last night, Jesus had been in the garden with his disciples and Judas had come with all of the servants of the high priests of the Jewish people and he had betrayed Jesus. Jesus had gone willingly and peacefully with his captors. He had been uh, before the Jewish council and which, uh, where he had been accused and insulted. And now we've, we pick the story up where Jesus is being, being brought in front of Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of the Syro-Palestine uh, area region in the time of Jesus. Pilate was the guy who could say, yes, you have a case to arrest and to convict and to punish this man, or no, you have no case. So let's pick the story up. Let's read it as it's recorded in the, in the book of Matthew. This is Matthew chapter 27 from verse 11 onwards. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer, but to Pilate he did give a reply. Then Pilate asked him, Don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge, to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, Which one do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him a message saying, Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release for you? asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What then shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, Crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed? asked Pilate, but they shouted all the louder, Crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water and he washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. All the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them, but he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. I know I said last night that uh, historically Easter services are not accompanied by uh, big sermons or big messages, but after reading the story and reading the story again and again and again and thinking about this, I, I do want to say one or two things about the position that Jesus finds himself in, not only in relation to the people who were there at his crucifixion, but also in relation to our own sinful natures. Because it seems to me, when I consider my own sin, and when I consider the sin of humanity, that we are always caught somewhere between Peter and Pilate and the priests. And what I mean by that is, a certain sinful part of each of us acts like Peter and chooses to rather preserve ourselves than to be arrested with Jesus. And even in Peter's case in particular, as we know, even disowning Jesus three times in the courtyard of the, Sanhedrin, of the Sanhedrin. Another part of us, I feel, is very much like Pilate. You know, especially at the time of Easter, you find many people, Christians or otherwise, 
who sympathize deeply with Jesus' suffering, who fully and completely agree that he suffered a great injustice and that he suffered terribly at the hands of the Jews and the Romans. And while they make the argument, the very, I suppose, intellectual argument to say what happened to Jesus wasn't right, at a certain point, they wash their hands like Pilate. And I suppose all of us wash our hands like Pilate and say, well, what happened to Jesus wasn't right, but I wasn't there. I had nothing to do with it. And of course, as we know, that's not the case. Jesus was crucified for all our sins. More than that, he wasn't just crucified for our sins. He was crucified by our sins. Our sinful natures nailed him to the cross. Our sinful natures who chooses, who always chooses us above all else, was mocking him on the day of his crucifixion. And I also think we're quite like the priests. In that the priests, the main sin they committed was thinking that they had God all figured out. They accused Jesus of blasphemy because they are so convinced that they know who speaks for God and who doesn't. They accused Jesus who came loving, caring, ministering to the poor and the sick and the blind. They accuse him of blasphemy for claiming to be the Son of God because they are so convinced that they know who the Son of God is. And it certainly isn't the one they call Jesus of Nazareth. Now I hope in the church there aren't many of us who are that arrogant in our faith to say, well, we know who the Son is and who isn't. But on a smaller, minor level, I think we must always be guarding against thinking we know what God wants. Thinking or being convinced that we know what God's plan is. And you see, it's these three sins, the sins of Peter and the disciples, the sin of Pilate and all those who will try to wash their hands of Jesus' crucifixion, and the sins of the priests and the people shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him, because we know what's best. I think that encapsulates all of human sin. And that is why none of us are spared. That is why none of us are innocent. That's why none of us can turn and say, well, Jesus died for the sin of the world, but not for mine. I'm okay. We'll listen to another piece of music that tries to convey something of this message, of this brokenness before God, of this position of acknowledging and confessing to the Lord that we are the ones who committed this sin. That we are as guilty of his crucifixion as the Jews and the Romans who were there on the day. Let's listen to the music and make it our first prayer together for this service. Oh, 
thou, my Lord, hast suffered Was all for sinners gain My sin was the transgression But thine the deadly pain Lo, here I fall, my sin I deserve thy place Look on me with thy favor Thou save me to thy grace The joy can never be spoken Above Let's read the account of the crucifixion and the death of our Lord together now. We're still in the book of Matthew, chapter 27. Chapter 27, verse 32 onwards. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull, there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. This was mentioned in Psalm 22 in the beginning. And sitting down, they kept watch over him there. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two robbers were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are really the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law and the elders mocked him, saying, He saved others, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel, so let him come down from the cross and we will believe him. He trusts in God, so let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the robbers who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Interesting piece of scripture that we have here. If we relate it to the first thing we read when we started this journey of Lent, 40 days ago, the first Sunday of Lent's reading this year was Jesus being tempted in the, de uh, in the desert by the devil. And if you can remember that far back, you remember I said then that we often think the temptation of Jesus in the, de in the desert was the last time he was tempted. The, de the devil tempted him three times. And Jesus rebuked the temptation three times, and that was that. Jesus was never tempted again. But here you see people like you and I, who took their faith seriously, ordinary people, leaders of the religious institutions, tempting Jesus in his hour of greatest pain and need. If you're the Son of God, come down. We'll believe you. If you can save others, we're sure you can save yourself. The temptation of Jesus didn't stop in the desert. 
that was the start of it. But this is its culmination. That Jesus is tempted in his hour of death to save himself, not this time by the devil, but by you and I. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. Immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar put it on a stick, and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes down to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were, ra were raised to life. They came out of the tombs and after Jesus' resurrection they went into the holy city and appeared to many people. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. Many women were there watching from a distance. They had followed Jesus from Galilee to care for his needs. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Joseph, and the mother of Zebedee's sons. The curtain tearing in the temple. The curtain in the temple separated the most holy area where God was considered to reside from the less holy areas of the temple where people could walk and where the priests could do their ministry. And the moment that Jesus gives up his spirit, the moment that he dies, the curtain separating the most holy, the holy of holies, from ordinary people tears in two. We'll listen to one more piece of music as our second prayer. Our second prayer that reminds us that we who crucified the Lord, we who are guilty of his death, we now have access to him. We have access to the Holy of Holies. Thy deepest wrath. Prayed for faithless, I have been. No terrors have my soul deterred. No goodness wooed me from my sin. My heart is vile, my mind depraved. My flesh rebels against thy will. I am polluted. In thy sight, your Lord, have mercy on me still, have mercy on me, have mercy on me still, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. 
Without defense to thee I look To thee the only Savior fly Without a hope, without a friend In deep distress to thee I cry Speak peace to me, my sins forgive Dwell thou within my heart, O God Guilt and power of sin remove and fear me for thy best abode. Mercy on me, mercy on me still, mercy on me, mercy on me. Mercy on me, have mercy on me still, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Jesus died alone and insulted and accused. And after his death, he was taken down from the cross. And a man who had become his disciple, Joseph of Arimathea, asked Pilate for his body. And as we know, Joseph took the body and embalmed it with special fluids and then placed it in a grave that he had purchased and rolled a great stone in front of the grave. And that's where our Savior remained. And on the weekend of Easter, that's where he remains until Sunday morning. So now I invite you to snuff out your candle with me, here at the end of our service, at the end of Jesus' time on earth, vilified and crucified, although he was blameless and sinless. Our final piece of music, again, is a very old chant of the church, a very old hymn. The words repeating over and over, first in Greek and then in English, Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Pray this with me. And with all of us North Lakes Uniting Church members on this good, good Friday, pray it with me as you think of the price paid for your salvation. You think of the terrible price paid not only for your sins, but the terrible suffering endured by our Lord because of our sins. Snuff out your Christ candle and be reminded that the world was enveloped in darkness. But also know that this is not the end. That we will see each other on Sunday morning. And on Sunday morning we will once again light the Christ candle and we will finish the story and we will celebrate together and we will praise the Lord together. For the time is coming when he will be risen. Truly risen. I hope to see you all Sunday morning. Mm-hmm.